Thank you, David. And I think I can speak quickly and keep us on time. So um, thank you for having me in the session. Thanks for coming, everyone. I'm going to give a real nuts and bolts uh, talk about how to start a laparoscopic liver program based on our experience in Toronto, where we started a program from um, having no laparoscopic surgeons to a pretty robust program. These are my uh, disclosures. I'm not going to speak about anything uh, related to those today. So, and I'm not going to go through um, all the advantages of laparoscopic MIS surgery in general compared to open surgery, particularly at this meeting. But if we think about laparoscopic liver resection, the first cases were reported in the early 90s, and since then, the number and the complexity of cases in it has increased. I looked at the um, Nesquib data set uh, about a day ago, and we can see that about 25% of liver resections now have a MIS approach to them. And you can see from this uh, systematic review into, and uh, that uh, Go was involved in, that they looked at the number um, of laparoscopic liver resections and the uptake that was reported in the literature, and that in 2016, um, over 9,000 cases had been reported at that time, and most of them were, min uh, were minor liver resections, but there was an increasing proportion over time of major hepatectomies being done, and the vast majority of them were done uh, for HCC, um, but uh, colorectal liver metastases also represents a, a substantial number that were done from malignant indications. There are multiple benefits over liver resection and all of the case series and the uh, literature does support that there are advantage over liver resection. Uh, also theoretically, a minimally invasive approach decreases physiologic stress, decreases peritoneal trauma, um, uh, including decreasing incision size, post-operative pain, morbidity, uh, and length of stay. And importantly, there's a substantial patient acceptability for this laparoscopic approach. So there was a, 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 the first consensus meeting was in 2008 in Louisville, and then a follow-up consensus meeting was organized by David and Go, who are uh, the moderators here today, and, and they put together a group of international experts to talk about the consensus um, for laparoscopic liver resection. And, and these are the main recommendations from that report from Morioka. First of all, that minor liver resection, so less than three segments, laparoscopic liver resection should be considered the standard of care. Major hepatectomy, three segments or more, particularly formal lobectomies and more, still remain at the innovation stage in the early um, and is not ready for standard of care. Importantly, they emphasize that global spread, including diffusion of the technology and the, inf and the approach, as well as education, was important. I think that's part of the reason that I'm here today talking about how we're going to get everyone here to start a program. And also that they emphasize that a scoring system that was able to discuss um, how difficult the laparoscopic liver resection was, was important to help people gauge whether patient appropriateness, case appropriateness was at their level, and also to provide a shared language going forward to assess how these outcomes um, of laparoscopic liver re resection can be assessed. And they also address some conceptual and technical techniques that I think some others later today will discuss um, at more length. In terms of one of the concerns when MIS surgery was first being used for um, oncology, all different types of oncology, including liver resection, is are the oncologic outcomes uh, similar? The most important one is our hands and our eyes are very good oncologic instruments, and there was concerns about whether the outcomes would be the same. And I, I want to reassure you that the, it does appear that the outcomes are similar. This is a systematic review from 2017 for colorectal liver metastases specifically. This included uh, 45 500 patients and 28 studies, and they do report that the oncologically important outcomes, including disease-free survival, overall survival is similar between the open and laparoscopic groups. I do want to emphasize here that in addition to that, if you look at the weighted mean difference, that all of the parameters that we normally measure for technical uh, um, considerations including blood loss, blood transfusion, um, or, uh, morbidity did favor laparoscopy. And the important oncologic outcomes which are shown here, and I'm sorry that the slide's a little bit small, show that the R0 resection rate uh, favored laparoscopy actually, and the overall survival rates and disease-free survivals were equivalent in the laparoscopic and the open group. 
And even better than a systematic review, and I think we've been very lucky in this area, is that in fact there um, is a randomized controlled trial comparing laparoscopic and open resection for colorectal liver metastases. And I must say this is a real tour de force, a very challenging kind of study to put together. At the time the study was out, there was actually two trials, one for major liver resections, uh, one for smaller liver resections, and the orange trial was closed due to a failure uh, to um, accrual rate being low. But this is from the um, Oslo Comet Group, and this is a randomized single center study looking at uh, laparoscopic liver resections for three segments or less. There were 280 patients randomized, of which 147 were in the open group and 133 in the laparoscopic group. And that you can see that um, the results uh, demonstrate are in favor of the laparoscopic group. So we can see that the uh, complication rate in the open group uh, was 31% compared to 19% for the laparoscopic group. If you look at the operative time and the blood loss, they were uh, equivalent and or a superior in the uh, laparoscopic group. And the post-operative uh, um, time in hospital, they actually counted this by hours, and I had to use a calculator to do this, but in fact, the laparoscopic group stayed for about 2.2 days, and the open group uh, stayed for about four days. And then also, if you look at the resection margin, so this addresses the issues of oncologic outcomes. You can see the oncologic outcomes were equivalent in the two groups with uh, resection margins uh, that were... Um, uh, less, uh, were 22% in each group, and that you can see that one thing that we were concerned about, and I do still remain concerned about in terms of when I have used a laparoscopic approach, is the possibility of a missed lesion. And you can see the missed lesion rate was four out of the 129 patients in the laparoscopic group and two out of 144 patients in the open group. This did not reach statistical significance, and I think one of the questions is that if they're very small and not well seen, they can be managed at a later date, so they didn't feel that was a substantial uh, detriment to the laparoscopic resections. So, so that's really the data. I think we actually have both, um, you know, uh, multiple case series and large case series that's, that all move in the same direction. And also importantly, we have a randomized control trial that all support uh, laparoscopic surgery being both safe um, and effective and, su and, and superior in many domains compared to open. So the question is, how do you get started? And are we ready? And I think we are ready. So I think that if you look at the uh, Rogers diffusion model of innovation, this comes from the business world. You know, the, early, the innovators and the early adopters include uh, people like David and Go here. And I think right now there are probably some of you who are trying to figure out how to jump this chasm from thinking about it and knowing it's probably the right thing to actually getting to it. And hopefully we'll provide you here with the tipping point um, to help us all get into the early majority and uh, diffuse this. So this is what we did. This is, and this is really nuts and bolts. How do you set up a program? You know, first of all, you have to get some kind of training. You have to then assemble the team, get the right equipment, choose the right patients, uh, and set and achieve milestones that you know whether you're meeting those targets or not, and you have to monitor your outcomes so you know if you're doing well and what you need to change. In terms of training, there are many paths to skill acquisition. Uh, I can tell you that I was an open surgeon. I'm old enough that I actually did no laparoscopy in my training, except I watched my staff do lap coles. Okay, when I first started. So I really, uh, my, me and my partner were very much self-trained in that. I think now there's many more opportunities to be formally trained, whether or not you come from a hepatobiliary open tradition, whether you come from an MIS fellowship, whether you need both. You know, there, I think there's many ways to skin a cat. You do need to have quite a bit of expertise in open liver resection so uh, that you are comfortable with what you're seeing and what you're doing uh, at the time of laparoscopy. And, and there's opportunities for training for surgeons already in practice, which many of you are. There are proctorships, and I know that uh, with some of my colleagues, Dr., um, including Sean Cleary and um, Dr. Alcetti, are putting together some proctorships. There's also some observerships where you can go watch people do surgery. I don't know if that is, you know, for those of you in training, I think that's probably not the optimal uh, path, but if you're already in practice, this, this may be enough to tip you over the chasm. And also there's formal mentorship courses where you can work with proctors and mentors to help you learn. 
What about getting started? I can't emphasize how important a team is. This is uh, my team in Toronto, and it wasn't just HPB surgeons. It actually included uh, multiple different kinds of surgeons. So we had at least two MIS surgeons. I would suggest that you work with a buddy, at least one buddy. They give you insight. You can bounce ideas off of a patient selection, input on the anatomy, whether or not this is the right oncologic patient to do it. And, they can, and you can assist each other and help each other with the learning curve. I also think it's very important to learn and not be afraid to learn and say, I really don't know, I need to learn from my MIS colleagues. They provide other kinds of insights that I as an open surgeon didn't have. First of all, they know stuff about equipment that I didn't know, you know, like maybe you should try X, this piece of equipment, maybe you should try the air seal, maybe you shouldn't. Some insights on, you know, MIS, really traditional MIS technique, port placement, patient placement, et cetera, which really help, um, and they can see things that you don't see. They can assist with new techniques that you're not familiar with or old techniques that you're not very good at, like suturing. And they can also help to both proctor, provide guidance, maybe a shoulder to cry on when you're learning. And I think also importantly, you have to have a good OR team. So you have to have experienced OR, HPB specific OR nursing that also have expertise in MIS setup, MIS equipment, MIS problems, and you have to, and they have to have knowledge of advanced instrumentation. And that's all very important. And also, I can't emphasize that really this should be done in the context of a center that has experience in all facets of HPB surgery, anesthesia, periop care rescue techniques, and those other uh, uh, important components. In terms of equipment, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but just talk about different types of equipment and say you should look at them all and see which ones match your, your style and flavor. I think you have to consider your optical instrumentation. I prefer a 3D uh, camera setup, but those that I have partners who prefer a 4D, a 4K setup, so whatever you're comfortable with, but exposure and visualization are essential. Equipment for access, how you create and maintain domain. Uh, think about what you want, try the different ones, and then also adjust if you need to. Hand port is part of that, whether you want to use a hybrid technique or not. In terms of transection devices, there's many types. One of them would include um, uh, energy, ult uh, dissectors, ultrasound dissectors such as a, uh, the water jet, or ultrasound dissectors and a staplers. Choose your poison, stick with it. I actually try them in the open situation so I know what to expect laparoscopically. And then, and then hemostatic uh, devices and hemostatic agents. And then advanced instrumentation, I think particularly if you're stepping up to larger cases, you should be thinking about bulldogs, vascular clamps, special retractors, and perhaps robotic platforms. And you have to get the right cases. Think about the anatomy, the exposure, and importantly, the lack of any oncologic concerns about margins and localization lesions. If you can't, if you're worried, you can't see them, and also safety considerations for the cases. And also, if you're doing anything else at the same time, uh, liver, um, colorectal operations or pumps. And these are good ones: peripheral lesions and the anterior segments. I would recommend, highly recommend, as you take this on, that you calculate the laparoscopic liver score, and this really, and this is from uh, um, um, Goes Group and Ban uh, published this, and this is really to uh, this helps you quantify how difficult the case is going to be, and that you can see where you are. This is there's a one to ten scale that you calculate based on tumor size. Um, I'm late, right? Okay, I'm going faster now. Okay, uh, that you can that you can that you can calculate, and that you can figure out where you are in the scale, but whether or not you should be addressing or tackling these cases. And I think this is very, very useful to reassure you, number one, you're not being brave enough or you shouldn't be doing that case quite yet, and number two, when you're ready to set, step up. Um, you know, I do a lot of uh, quality improvement in my other life, and I would just say, importantly, you need to set milestones. You have to set milestones, you've got to make sure you're achieving them, and if you're not, you have to figure out what you can adapt to make it better. Count the number of cases you're doing, graduate from easy to difficult, be where the learning curve is not smooth, you're gonna plateau a bit, and then choose relevant metrics to measure, both ones that have to do with safety and efficiency and oncology. And then nextly, monitor your performance. I would schedule regular intervals with your team, celebrate success if you fail, figure out what you did, be adaptable, change what's not working. Do I need more training? Do I need different equipment? Do I need to add or take away members? And then you should expect evolution. You're not gonna do it exactly the same the first day that you start as a year from now or two years from now. So really, um, you know, I think, in summary, I think it's achievable. 
you got to check these off. This is like a checklist, the perioperative checklist. Do I got training? Do I got a team? Do I have the right equipment? Do I have the right patience? Do I have milestones that I'm going to look at and I'm going to look at and make sure that I'm doing it, doing it well? Thank you.